Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Before we kick off today's episode of Law of the Cards, I wanted to let you all know that there's a giveaway related to today's episode. Basically, because I did those few episodes for Blizzard, the Black Rock Mountain ones and the Hero ones, they sent me a little bit of a gift. But I want to give a bit of that gift to you guys. Within there, there were 10 card pack codes. So, to be in with the chance of getting one of those 10 card pack codes, uh, all you have to do, uh, I basically ripped off a podcast, what they did for a competition for this. It's called the Peacock and Gamble podcast. Uh, if you like really childish humour, if you've got like the sense of humour of a five-year-old, you'll really like it. I do, so I really like it. Basically, in today's episode, there is an intentional mistake within it. So there might be a few little mistakes in the editing, that sort of thing, but it's not that. It's an obvious mistake. If you can tell me that mistake in the comments section below, or let me know on Twitter, or on Facebook, then you could be in with a chance of winning one of the 10 card pack codes. I'll pick them completely at random, and I'll probably get in contact with you before the end of this month. Either way, guys, hope you enjoyed the episode. I'm going to say bye, but I'm about to say hello again in two seconds' time, so bye! Hello and welcome back to Lore of the Cards, the series that looks to find the lore hidden deep within your Hearthstone deck. For the last vote, you guys voted between three groups. The Elemental Lords, the Murlocs, and the Druids. This one was a landslide, with the Mighty Lords taking 51% of the vote. The Murlocs scrabbled to create some resistance, but the Druids appeared to still be asleep in the Emerald Dream. In this episode, we will be covering all four Elemental Lords, including one that cannot yet be found in Hearthstone. Each will have a full, in-detail lore, except for Ragnaros, as he can easily fill his own episode. Want to see a full Rag episode? I really recommend Noble87's channel, who did a two-parter on the Fire Lord. Anyway, now you guys know what to expect, on with the episode. As Neptulon is on the thumbnail, let's take a look at the artist that supplied this sublime image. The art is by the Chinese artist Ruan Jia. It's easy to find his work, but difficult to find info on the man behind it. Like Art Germ last episode, Jia's work is some of my favourite. While it is produced digitally, it has a gorgeous painted feel to it. He's produced art for Guild Wars 2 and Legend of the Cryptids, as well as several Blizzard artworks. Jia has drawn artwork for several key Warcraft characters, Deathwing, Thrall and Arthas fighting Uther. In Hearthstone, his art is shown upon the Nefarian card and of course, the Tidehunter, Neptulon. There are a couple of different theories concerning Azeroth's early history. In both, the Titans play a key role. These metallic giants are godlike beings, some say they are gods, that travel the universe making order out of the chaos created after its birth. They have brought structure to hundreds of millions of worlds, and their noble venture continues to this day. One theory is that the Titans themselves were responsible for creating the world of Azeroth. The other states that Azeroth was already there, and was another planet that the Titans stumbled across during their quest to bring order. The second theory is backed up in World of Warcraft, by a book titled The Old Gods and the Ordering of Azeroth. The Old Gods referred to in the title of this book are not the Titans, but a force of malice and evil. After the Titans had created their world, or before they had even discovered Azeroth, grotesque Lovecraftian horrors called the Old Gods infected the world. Cthun, yogg saron Yasaraj, Nazoth, and at least one other that has not yet been discovered by Azeroth's current residents revel in chaos, and look to envelop the entire universe in it. To create chaos upon Azeroth, the Old Gods enslaved the Elementals on the planet, and sent massive armies at each other's bastions in an attempt to fully claim the world as their own. Alliances were formed and broken between the Old Gods, as their Elemental armies charged into battle one another. 
each led by an elemental lord that exemplified their element and answered only to the old gods as their lieutenants. The lightning quick Alakir led the wind elementals. According to the non-canonic Warcraft RPG, Alakir was the weakest of the four elemental lords, preferring hit and run attacks, though the others could never defeat him as the skies were his home, making it difficult to battle him on his home turf. The destructive Ragnaros ruled the fire elementals, putting all that stood against him to the flame. Therizane ruled the earth elementals. The earth mother would crush all that stood before her underneath her gigantic bulk. Finally, Neptulon the Tide Hunter, ruler of the water elementals, is rumoured to be the most powerful of them all. His element extinguishes flame, wears away the earth and the air choked within its depths. The ages passed and the elemental war between the old gods raged on, no end in sight, until the arrival of the titans. As the gargantuan beings observed Azeroth, they became increasingly disturbed by the old gods' lust for evil. Knowing that the old gods could not be left to their chaotic rampage, the titans proclaimed war upon them, but it would not be the old gods that the titans had to deal with first. Their elemental minions stood as a barrier. At the start of the war, Ragnaros underestimated the titans, sending his second-in-command Baron Geddon to attack the giants with an army. Geddon's forces were crushed with ease, and in his rage, Ragnaros instantly demoted Geddon. Though Geddon proved not to be as incompetent as Ragnaros thought, all the elemental lords possessed powers beyond mortal comprehension, but the titans were able to defeat them and their armies with relative ease. It was the old gods themselves that proved to be the issue. It is presumed that the first old god fought by the titans was Yasaraj. The beast was slain, but upon death he cursed the land around him, forever corrupting it. This corruption would later manifest as the Shah upon the continent of Pandaria. Cthun feigned his death, and Yogg-Saron, Nazoth, and presumably the unnamed old god were imprisoned, the titans learning from their previous mistake. The order I mention here is only a guess. The old gods had infected Azeroth for so long that to kill them would have also destroyed the very fabric of the world. It took the combined might of the titans strongest to subdue the old gods one by one. Perhaps if the old gods had set aside their differences and joined forces, the results of this war could have been very different. The Elementals roamed Azeroth because the old gods willed it, and without their power to anchor them to the world, the Titans banished the Elemental Lords and their armies to the Elemental Plane. This plane of existence was created by the Titans to imprison the Elementals, their feuding happening far away from the beautiful world the Titans looked to shape. Within their new plane, each of the Elemental Lords claimed territory, and were placed in realms of existence ideal for their elemental type. Alakir and his minions lived in Skywall. Beautiful, ornate structures with their foundations in the clouds made up the Wind Lord's kingdom. The ornate structures are deceptive, as strong winds constantly flow through the realm, lightning frequently dancing across the skyline. Within this realm, there are creatures that cannot be discovered anywhere else. The Dijin, often acting as Alakir's lieutenants, and the mysterious Storm Dragons. Ragnaros and his minions preside in the Firelands, a searing, molten realm that reflects the rage of their ruler. It is certainly the least welcoming of the elemental planes. Lakes of lava, rough, jagged mountains, and ash upon the air so thick it can choke you. Flame Wakers, Firehawks, and other blazing elementals call this burning landscape home. Perhaps one of the more serene elemental realms is Therizane's home of Deepholm. The grey rocky landscape has a subdued beauty, vibrantly coloured crystals dotting the landscape. Unlike the Firelands and Skywall, an eerie peace floats upon the air, 
a great deal of the creatures of Deepholm creating burrows below the ground. Shale spiders and Gaia worms weave around the depths of their intricate networks. Above ground, the earth elementals roam, and in the sky, stone drakes soar. At its centre, the Temple of Earth stands tall. Neptulon's realm is the Abyssal Moor, an ocean so vast and deep it is rumoured that light is unable to reach its depths. In the water's depths and above, the ocean churns, kicking up into whirlpools and torrents that would push any mortal body to its limits. It is this elemental realm that we know the least solid information about, as the only concrete description given is in the non-canonic Warcraft RPG. Within the world of Warcraft, the Firelands and Deepholm have been thoroughly explored. Two instances have been set in Skywall, but only one in the Abyssal Moor. Despite having perfect environments forged for them by the Titans, the Elemental Lords were not content with the territory they had been gifted. As a result, they started to try and claim each other's. A long, drawn-out 5,000-year battle called the Elemental Sundering took place. Very little is known about this fight between the Elementals. In fact, we only know of one event, the defeat of Prince Thunderan. Due to his title, it is a possibility that Thunderan is the son of Alakir, though this may just be a title. It is stated that Thunderan was betrayed by several fire elementals. What this tells us is that the Elemental Sundering was not a four-way battle, and Elemental Lords would partner up to fight another. The event of Thunderan's defeat also shows us that these partnerships were very uneasy. The attack on Thunderan was said to be planned by one of Ragnaros' most powerful lieutenants, the disgraced Baron Geddon. Along with Gar, another of Ragnaros' commanders, Geddon was able to lure Thunderan away from his forces. When Geddon's betrayal was revealed, Thunderan must have put up a strong resistance, battling both Geddon and Gar. But there was no way the prince would escape when the Fire Lord himself intervened, striking Thunderan down with a mighty blow from his hammer, Sulfurus. Geddon had not betrayed Thunderan to just remove a powerful soldier of the Wind Lords. Thunderan had also been defeated so that Ragnaros could feed on his essence, fueling the Fire Lord's power. Ragnaros gorged upon Thunderan, but the prince was in fact so powerful that the Fire Lord could not fully consume him. To prevent the prince from reforming, Ragnaros placed his remaining essence within a talisman. Splitting it in two, he gave one piece to Geddon, and the other to Gar. As time passed, the elemental sundering raged on. The battle was so intense that many elementals sought to escape from the unending chaos. These elementals were able to find cracks in the barrier that separated their realm from Azeroth, and made their way to this calmer, more peaceful world. Old habits die hard, however, as the elementals that made their way to Azeroth still tended to be more aggressive than placid, and would often find themselves striving to claim territory like they did in the elemental plane, coming into conflict with the inhabitants of Azeroth on occasion. One elemental that made their way through was the only daughter of Therizane, Princess Theradras. While on Azeroth, Theradras fell in love with Zayatar, the first son of the demigod Cenarius. The union between Zayatar and Theradras gave birth to an entirely new race, the Centaur. However, despite being born from love, the Centaur were a misbegotten race, savage and warlike. One of the Centaur's first actions would be to kill their own father. Stricken by grief and fearing Cenarius' retribution, Theradras hid away deep within the earth, taking her lover's body and spirit with her. She buried Zayatar and watched over his remains. Around the Keeper's grave, the centaur stronghold of Marauddon was founded. The imprisoned old gods were able to find Theradras and bind her as a servant to their will. Whether this happened before or after Zayatar's death is not entirely clear. 
Under the old god's influence, an empowered Therodras sought to crush any that dare step into her territory. Heroes did to deal a blow to the aggressive centaur, and in fact defeated the daughter of Therizane. It would appear that this defeat only bound Therodras to her chamber, as she appears later in our story as well. One of these cracks between the worlds turned into a gaping hole during the Dwarven Civil War called the War of the Three Hammers. This was fought between the three Dwarven clans, Bronzebeard, Wildhammer and Dark Iron. You can find more detail about this war by looking into my Black Rock Mountain miniseries. The Dark Irons have managed to attract the ire of both the other clans, and as the two clans marched on the Dark Iron capital, the Emperor Thorasan came to a grim realisation that his clan was done for. This Emperor Thorasan is the ancestor of Dagran Thorasan, who can be found in Hearthstone. Thorasan would not go down without a fight, and he, along with the Seven, an inner circle of the Dark Iron's most powerful spellcasters, sought to summon their salvation. Not fully understanding the spell they wove, Thorasan and the Seven broke the chains that bound one of the most potent elemental lords to his plane, those of Ragnaros. With a force that shook the very world of Azeroth, Ragnaros crashed through the barrier between his realm and Azeroth with such violence it created the Black Rock Mountain, charred the land and instantly vaporised his summoners. This caused both the Bronzebeard and Wildhammer to flee, fearing what the Dark Irons had summoned. Hundreds of years passed. The remaining Dark Irons were enslaved, Ragnaros gathered his power in the molten core of the Black Rock Mountain, and Fire Elementals would make their way to the mountain via the Tear Between Worlds. Towards the end of this time, the First and Second War raged between Orcs and humans, the Orcs using Black Rock Mountain as their base of operations, unaware of Ragnaros' presence. After the Orcs' defeat in the Second War, many beaten soldiers of the Horde once again took up residence in the mountain. These orcs were attacked by Ragnaros' Dark Iron slaves, but with the timely arrival of the Black Dragon Nefarian, he saved the orcs and used them as his servants. An ongoing conflict would play out between the forces of Ragnaros and the forces of Nefarian, much like we saw with the Hearthstone adventure. Recognising the threat these two monsters posed to their world, heroes were able to banish Ragnaros from the Molten Core back to the Firelands and slay Nefarian. After Ragnaros' defeat, the effect of the Elementals on Azeroth was relatively minimal. That was until the event known as the Cataclysm that tore at the very fabric of the world of Azeroth. Several years prior to the Cataclysm, the Black Dragon Aspect Deathwing suffered a terrible defeat at the hands of the other Dragon Aspects, as well as the Human Mage Ronin and his companions. Devastating wounds racked Deathwing's body, and the Aspect desperately sought a place to recover. Bridging the barrier between Azeroth and the Elemental Plane, Deathwing came to rest in Therizane's realm of Deepholm. Deathwing did not always go by his ominous title. He was once Neltharion, the wise aspect of Earth. Neltharion was driven mad when the old gods reached out to him, twisting his thoughts and turning the dragon into the aspect of death that would come to be known as Deathwing. Since that time, over 10,000 years ago, Deathwing has been a tool of the old gods, one of their most powerful. Knowing that Deathwing had suffered great injuries, the Twilight's Hammer Cult came to his aid. Mortal races that worshipped the Old Gods and sought to bring about the destruction of Azeroth. They began to twist Therizane's realm to suit their needs and aid Deathwing's recovery. The Hammer took over the Temple of Earth at the centre of Deepholm, and using the stone core found within the temple, fashioned Elementium Plates. Deathwing had already had a few of these armour plates attached to his body, but the additional power gifted to him by the Old Gods threatened to tear the Raging Worm apart. 
Not only would the plates created by the hammer stitch up Deathwing's wounds, but the plates fashioned from the strongest metal known on Azeroth would prevent Deathwing being killed by his own strength. Therizane's wariness toward the Twilight's hammer was only increased when they began to force their will upon her earth elementals. The rocky creatures were bound by strange metal contraptions, and when they were, followed the order of the hammer. With the mighty tool of the old god's Deathwing present, there was little Therizane could do to stop them. Deathwing's wounds nearly healed, he began his preparations to re-enter the world of Azeroth. As the Aspect readied himself, the prisons that held the Elemental Lords to their planes began to weaken. With a possibility to reclaim the world they were banished from, the Elemental Lords seized it. Their armies assaulted the Horde and Alliance capitals. Buildings were torn apart and set aflame, but somehow the Alliance and Horde were able to push back the Elementals and the Twilight's Hammer that assisted in the invasion. Their city safe, they tracked down the commanders of the Elemental armies. These Elementals were lieutenants of Cho Gaul, the leader of the Twilight's Hammer that had orchestrated the attack. Grand Ambassador Flamelash represented fire. The Beast Gazrilla, favoured pet of the old gods was being prepared to be unleashed upon the cities, representing water. Prince Sarsaren led the wind elementals, and Princess Theradras led the earth elementals. As heroes stormed Theradras's domain to put an end to her once and for all, they were privy to a conversation between her and an image of Cho Gaal. The ogre stated that with the unrest, Theradras could now leave where she had been confined to, but Theradras scoffed. Teramok, the depths of Marodon, were her home, as her lover's remains were there, and she would not leave. Addressing Cho'Gal as the servant of Deathwing, she assured him that her earth elementals would aid his invasion, as it brought her great pleasure to bring strife to the world up above. Promptly after, the heroes slew her, destroying any hope Therese may have had of being reunited with her daughter. The elementals driven away, the races of Azeroth were given little relief. Not long after, Deathwing returned. He left Deepholm, utterly smashing through the barrier between the realm of Earth and Azeroth. Deathwing's entry shook the world far more than Ragnaros's hundreds of years earlier, and scars formed across the entirety of Azeroth. The elemental unbalance even created new life, the once dry region of Desolus suddenly bursting with plant life within certain areas. With his return, Deathwing also brought with him powerful allies, two of the elemental lords pledging themselves to the dragon aspect service in the name of their old masters, the old gods. The first to reveal himself was Ragnaros, his army, with the Twilight's Hammer's assistance, setting the region of Hyjal aflame, seeking to burn down the recovering world tree, Nodrasil. This powerful tree that once gave the Night Elves immortality was damaged during the Burning Legion's second invasion of Azeroth. The Legion are a force that look to bring complete destruction. In the wake of Deathwing's return, Ysera investigated the Emerald Dream, a realm the Titans created that displayed how Azeroth would be if no living beings altered its surface. During my stay in the dream, I made a vital discovery. The rift that weakens the boundaries of this world has hastened the return of powerful allies. The ancient guardians are coming back. Cenaris, Aviana, Goldrin. I can feel their presence. We must make sure we usher them into this world. Their timely aid will be indispensable. The ancient guardians were extremely powerful beasts born at the dawn of Azeroth's reshaping, Barsenarius, who was the son of Malorn. Many met their end defending the world against the first invasion of the Burning Legion 10,000 years ago. Again, except for Cenarius, whose death was much more recent. 
heroes were able to revive several of the ancient guardians to aid them in their struggle against the fire elementals. Cenarius, along with Malfurion and the Tauren druid Hamal Rune Totem, were able to banish Ragnaros back to the Firelands. With the threat of Hyjal in check, heroes were relied upon to reap the occasional reward amongst the chaos of the Cataclysm, and also prevent the world from falling apart. During the Cataclysm, an island emerged, just off the coast of the Alliance capital of Stormwind. The Horde looked to seize it to gain a tactical advantage over the Alliance, and the Alliance sought to prevent this. A small force sailed from the harbour of both factions, but neither would make it. They were ambushed by the Naga and the terrifying Kraken, Ozumat. Many died, but a few were able to scrabble together enough resources to survive in the underwater region of Vashir, an ancient sunken night elven city controlled by the Naga. These serpents were once the best of their night elven brethren, but sold out their people 10,000 years ago for the promise of power from the Burning Legion, heralding the force's first invasion. Upon their defeat, their capital sunk to the ocean's depths, and they were transformed into the hateful Naga. It is thought that the old gods had a hand in their transformation. As heroes sought to escape Vashir, they found the Naga's frenzied activity disturbing. Through a fractured piece of Naga weaponry that belonged to a powerful battle maiden, the party were able to gain glimpses into the past. Not only did they learn that the Naga sought to lay claim to Neptulon's realm and use its power as theirs, they had also been able to lay claim to an artifact and summon faceless ones to aid them servants of the old gods to make Neptulon's defeat almost certain. If Neptulon were defeated, the Naga would be able to plunder his realm for any secrets that they may use towards their nefarious ends. Neptulon was unaware of the Naga's intent until they were right on his doorstep. You and your scaly worms are no match for me. You've reached too far, Serpent. You shall suffer greatly for your trespass. To me, my minions! Strike now! <gasps> now! Unleash the Kraken! You fool! This day! Shall be your last! Follow me, my pets! No is ours at last. With Ozumat clinging to his face, Neptulon was forced into a retreat. The Naga pursued Neptulon, and the giant Kraken enveloped Neptulon's sanctuary of the Throne of Tides in its grasp stunting the Tidehunter's power. With this, the Naga were able to take over the Tidehunter's domain. Not wanting to let the Naga gain any knowledge to be used against them, heroes of the Alliance and Horde ventured into the Throne of Tides. They were able to slay many of the attacking Naga and Faithless Ones, as well as their leader, Lady Nazjar. Using pulses of electricity, Ozumat's grasp was weakened, and Neptulon gained enough of his power back to empower the heroes to drive the Kraken away. However, despite this victory, Ozumat was able to grasp Neptulon and carry him away further into the Abyssal Moor. To this day, the story of Neptulon and the Naga has never been fully resolved. When Deathwing crashed through into Azeroth from Deepholm, he also shattered the World Pillar found within the Temple of Earth. The World Pillar was created by the Titans to bear the weight of the elemental and magnetic forces found within Deepholm. With it destroyed, Deepholm was set to collapse in on Azeroth, destroying them both. The most powerful shaman of the Earthen Ring organization gathered, including Thrall, at the Maelstrom, the entry to Deepholm. It took all of their combined strength just to prevent the collision of realms. 
members of the Earthen Ring travelled through the Maelstrom to discover the issue, and chased out many of the Twilight's hammer dwelling in the Temple of Earth. As they steadied the pillar from within Deepholm, they sent heroes out to try and discover the World Pillar Fragments. One was gifted to them after helping the Earthen fight the Stone Trogs, the mighty Trogzor among them. The other was wrested from the Twilight's hammer themselves. The final piece lay in the hands of Therizane. The Stone Mother's forces were now aggressive towards all mortals. The Twilight's hammer had damaged her realm almost beyond repair, and her daughter had been slain by mortal hands. Therizane had launched full-scale attacks on the Twilight's hammer in an attempt to chase them from her realm, but they were stubborn. With two pieces of the World Pillar out of three returned to the Temple of Earth, Therizane launched an attack on the Earthen Ring. Since the Shaman were mortals like the Hammer, the Stone Mother immediately assumed they intended her realm harm. The Earthen Ring desperately sought an Earth Elemental that would listen to reason. Their initial attempts fell on deaf ears, Earth Elementals being notoriously stubborn. The patient Diamant did have time to listen to reason, however, and after the heroes proved they were not like the Twilight's Hammer by killing a few, Diamant requested to let the Fleshlings aid Therizane and her forces. Is this the one you are wasting your time with, Diamant? Not wasted, Stone Mother. It has been very useful. It stands to reason that it may be here for exactly the reasons it says it is. Then you take responsibility for its actions, Stone Lord. You will be the one answering to me when it shows its true intent. And you, Fleshling, consider for a moment that you are entirely surrounded by rock in this place. The very earth you walk on bends to my will. If you betray us, there will be no escape for you. I will crush your body so slowly that you shall hear every single one of your bones break. I'm glad we had this talk. With a little leeway given by Therizane herself, the champions set out to gain the Stone Mother's favour, aiding the Earth Elementals around Deepholm. They extinguished threats and won the Stone Drakes back over to the command of the Earth Elementals, creatures that respected strength. The heroes travelled to Therizane's throne and found her discussing their acts with her trusted Stone Lords. Despite the fact that Therizane could never bring herself to fully trust a mortal due to the slaughter of her mourning daughter, she had come to a conclusion. So small, so soft. It's a wonder you even lasted this long down here, Fleshling. Or perhaps a testament to your abilities. All of this for a piece of the world pillar? What exactly, Shaman, do you intend to do with it? We came here to seal the rift that wing tore into Azeroth. We need the World Pillar to repair the hole on this side. And what then? Will you leave Deep Home to its denizens? We'll leave. We've no desire to stay where we're not welcome. I'm glad you're at least that perceptive. I propose this. We will march on the Twilight Cult and extinguish any utterings of Deathwing's name from this realm. Your Earthen Ring will march with us. You do this, and I will send Gorsic to the temple with our piece of the World Pillar. Seal the rift and leave this place. We'll be doing exactly that then. You have our thanks, Stun Mother. Save your thanks. We march upon the Twilight Precipice as soon as our forces are gathered. I expect to see you on the battlefield. The Earthen Ring aided the Stone Mother in clearing out the Twilight's hammer from her realm, 
and, true to her word, she had the Peace of the World Pillar transported to the Temple of Earth. The Twilight's Hammer made one last ditch attempt to prevent the ritual repairing the World Pillar, but were unsuccessful. The Earthen Ring were true to their word and promptly left, but the Stone Mother was happy for the champion to stay and aid her rebuild her realm. One task she lay out before the champion was the necessary evil of killing an earth elemental that had allied itself with the Twilight's hammer, Osruk. Over the dry continent of Aldum, a gateway had appeared leading to Alakir's realm of Skywall. Deathwing had been able to convince the Windlord to join his destructive rampage. With the mighty Conclave of Wind aiding him, Alakir enacted Deathwing's will. Alakir sent Siama, one of the Conclave, to offer a gift to the Tolvir that inhabited Uldum in exchange for their loyalty to Deathwing. Siama would turn their weak bodies of flesh into ones of stone. Those that refused the gift Alakir offered would see their cities buried underneath a devastating sandstorm, like the Tolvir of the city Orsis. Many Tolvir joined the Windlord's army. Alakir suffering a minor setback when a drained Siamat was betrayed and imprisoned by one Tolvir clan. Those that joined the Windlord began training, torturing those that refused to join the Elemental Lord and preparing to unleash his wrath upon Aldum. Alakir would not be able to act on his plans, as heroes of Azeroth attacked several areas of his realm, finally coming for the Windlord himself. With the defeat of the Conclave of Wind, Alakir admired the prowess and honourable conduct of the heroes that attacked and invited them to battle him. The Windlord fought with the ferocity of a thousand storms, his power of the winds not allowing the hero's feet to touch the ground, but eventually he was defeated. As Alakir fell in his own realm, it meant the Windlord was now dead. The armies of Ragnaros return yet again in Hyjal, preventing a ritual to restore the World Tree, and splitting Thrall, essential for the ritual, into four elemental forms, using Thrall's affinity for the elements against him. Heroes travelled to the elemental planes to free Thrall's captured elemental forms. Therizane was slow to let Thrall's Earth Spirit leave her realm, as she was intrigued by it. However, when beseeched by Thrall's mate Agra, Therizane gave her blessing to retrieve Thrall's spirit. She could see Agra deeply loved Thrall, and had not forgotten what it was to feel love. Who the Great Stone Mother had loved, we do not know. With Thrall restored, and with the aid of Malfurion, the heroes of Azeroth attacked Ragnaros in his realm, and he too met his end. With the death of both Alakir and Ragnaros, the realms of the Firelands and Skywall do not have elemental lords. One elemental in each realm will rise up and claim their titles. What this means for Azeroth, we'll just have to wait and see. So, there you have it, a relatively in-depth lore of all the elemental lords, except for Ragnaros. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I'd love to hear what you liked and disliked in the comments section below. Then. I can try and make this series better. If you did enjoy, a like, subscribe and a share are hugely appreciated. If you've enjoyed the art, I've done my best to credit as many artists as possible in the description below. If you let Deathwing boss you around, I guess you'll be hitting the dislike button. I'll be off to America for a week on the 16th of August, so the next big episode will likely be out after that, and I plan to hit up some more in-depth Grand Tournament lore. So, here's a few I reckon I can make an episode on. Let me know your favourites in the description below. Till next time guys, happy hearthstoning, and I'll see you for more Lore of the Cards.